Good afternoon. We're just on the cusp. And happy St. David's Day to any Welsh people in the audience. I've come up from Cardiff today. Um, but you can see my surname's Italian, so buongiorno to any Italians in the audience as well. So we're going to talk about something completely different. I'm not an oncologist, I'm not a cancer biologist, I'm a microbiologist. So the first thing I'd like to do is ask the audience, who's heard of the human microbiome? Okay, that's brilliant, okay? So I can just leave now, because you, you obviously know so much about it. But if I'd asked you 10 years ago, there'd be maybe one, if no, hands up. Have, has anybody read any of the popular books on the human microbiome? Yeah, okay, so fewer, so you've heard of it, and some of you are, are near experts like myself. Okay, so what we're gonna be talking about today is the concept of this human microbiome in cancer. And so I'll just start with some definitions, because what is out there is sometimes misleading. So what we do know, and do I have a laser pointer on here? No, I can't use the PowerPoint laser pointer. I can try, let's see what happens. Can you see the red dot? Okay, <laughs> fancy, isn't it? <laughs> um, we know what lives inside us in terms of the microbes are not microflora. We don't have a flora, they're not plants. We used to call them the flora and the microflora. They've been given a new name. They're called the microbiota. And that's everything that lives in and on us. Okay, that's the viruses, that's the fungi, that's the small parasites. Apparently, everybody in the world has about one to two parasites that live in their gut, but they're benign, they're not doing anything to you, they just set up home in your gut. But the majority of the organisms by weight are bacteria. So that's what we're really in is interested in, is knowing who's there, okay, and how abundant they are, because they change over time. Now, this microbiome concept is shown below here. So a biome is a collection of organisms and the environment. You should be familiar with things like a rainforest biome or a prairie bi biome or marine biome. So that's everything that's in there. All the different things interacting together. When we talk about the gut microbiome, we're talking about diet, what you eat, which is a real important driver of what's in there. We're talking about you as the host, because you interact with what's living in your gut. You put antibodies in there, you put mucin, mucus into it. And of course, there's the microbiota, all those organisms that live inside your gut. And combined together, they create a unique system. Now, the human microbiome is made up of lots of different microbiomes. There's also a lung microbiome. Your lungs are not sterile. There's a skin microbiome. There's a nasopharyngeal up your nose microbiome. And in fact, if you look at the skin, the elbow is different to the um, crease behind the ear, to the different to the teeth section here. They're all different microbiomes. And these organisms come together to produce functions. They do jobs in those systems. And what we're really interested in is the jobs that these organisms do in the gut. This is where this started about 20, 21 years ago when I got involved in this. And so we're really in, in, interested in understanding what happens in your gut and what we can do about it. And the reason we're really interested in about, about it is because of this model here. So this model here is one that's used many times to try to understand a lot of the non-communicable diseases. And what I mean by that are cancer, heart disease, diabetes, a lot of these diseases you don't get from getting an infectious organism or a pathogen, a virus coming into you. These are the big diseases of the developed world. Heart disease, cancer, obesity, et cetera, et cetera. And what we see is the risk here is not being very well explained by what you inherit. Now, we know there are some diseases, there are inherited cancers that are very clear that there's a link between what you get from your parents and the risk that you have of developing that cancer. And there are things like cystic fibrosis that we know if you inherit the two genes from your parents, you will get cystic fibrosis and lung infections. But as microbiologists, what we've been trying to do is understand what this new kid on the block is doing, this collection of microbes in your gut and how they're interacting with your genome with your genes that you've inherited. They interact with what's now called the exposome, and the exposome is everything you're exposed to in your environment. Pollutants, sunlight, UV light, diet, things in your diet, how your diet's being made, how your diet's being cooked, all those different exposures that you come across in your natural history of your life. Even the, going all the way back to whether you were vaginally born or cesarean born. That, that's a very early indicator and it has an indication and a change and can change what happens in your gut. And all these different exposures link together into a very complex system that drives, we think, this disease health balance. Now, there are groups out there who are trying to be able to produce tools to edit your genome, 
So if you do inherit a gene that gives you disease, they want to be able to put in the new gene, the good gene, and, and reestablish a healthy state. There's a lot of debate whether that's ethical. There's a lot of debate whether it can be done safely. The ethical debate is who's going to get first access to that. It's going to be Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, because it's so expensive. <laughs> We're going to be at the end of the queue waiting for our gene editing. However, if we think a significant amount of risk is coming from what's living in your gut, we can really modify that quite easily. We can use antibiotics to modify it. We try not to because of the risk of antibiotic resistance, but antibiotics are really good at modifying it. Diet is very good at modifying it. And what I'll talk about later on is something called a fecal microbiota transplant, which does exactly as it says on the tin. It transplants a stool sample from one person to another person. And that's becoming quite popular, and it's a very powerful tool, especially in the melanoma cancer space. So the way that your gut microbiota, all these microbes, especially the bacteria, talk to you and interact with you is with the chemicals that they make. And the chemicals that they make are influenced by what you give them to eat, which is your diet. And we're really interested in understanding those chemicals that the bacteria make, what they do, and how we can maximize them. And one way that we really know that the microbes in you are important is because we can rear rodents, mice and rats, in a totally sterile environment. Not many people know this. We can do pigs as well. But we can keep them in a sterile environment. What I mean by that is they never see microbes. And every single aspect, so the exocrine system is your sweat glands, your pancreas, that doesn't work as well. All your hormonal systems are affected by an absence of a microbiota. Your liver doesn't work as well, your heart doesn't work as well, your brain doesn't work as well. Every single aspect of being a mammal, and this goes up to humans, is affected by an absence of the microbiota. What we don't know is why. Why the mechanisms of doing this? And the reason we think this is is because we've evolved in a microbial world, not the other way around. The microbes were here way before we were here. And as we evolved, we had to interact with these microbes as they colonized us and got into us. So we've come to use them as beneficial organisms. And they do benefit us hugely. The other reason we're really interested is a lot of these diseases, non-communicable diseases, like cervical cancer, colorectal colon cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, even having a preterm baby, so if you're a woman pregnant, you have a risk of going to having a pre premature baby that can be driven by the microbiota, not in the gut, but in that case in the vagina. So the microbiota is throughout your body. And those collection of organisms influence different diseases. What we've been doing in the last sort of 20 years is making these associations between what's living in you as microbes and all these diseases that we think are important. And we're slowly now getting to the point of a cause and effect. We're getting away from an association and we're starting to say, well, actually, we think there's a real presence of an organism here that's driving disease or influencing the disease. So the next phase of micro human microbiome will be actually identifying where there's organisms that are driving and not just associated with them. So your whole gut starts at your mouth, finishes at your anus, and it's fully colonized by bacteria. Starts in the oral cavity. Stomach is not sterile. We used to, people used to say the stomach was sterile because of the acid in it. It's not. There are millions of bacteria living in your stomach. When you get down to the large intestine, now we're talking large numbers, 100 trillion bacteria. To give you a sense of that, your body has about 90 trillion cells in it, OK? And so there's more bacteria than there are human cells in your body. Now, by weight, you're more human, but actually, by number, you're more microbial. And it contains, in your large intestine, up to about two kilograms, a bag of sugar worth of material. And it makes it one of the most po densely populated systems on Earth. There is nothing anywhere on Earth that has that much bacterial biomass in it. If we examine the poo from the gut, which is what we do, it's not ideal, because it doesn't tell us about everything that's happening in there, but it's what we can easily access relatively. Poo is not undigested food. Your gut is brilliant at extracting all that it needs from your diet, OK? And it leaves very little left over for the microbes to grow on. But what it does leave over are a lot of undigested plant materials, most commonly known as fiber. And that's what the microbes in your gut really like, especially in the large intestine. In the small intestine, you're fighting those microbes for sugars, fats, and proteins that you need, but also the microbes have evolved to take as well. And so you're in a, you're in a battle in your small intestine, but when it gets a large intestine, your body's given up on that diet. It's passed it on and said, take what you want from this. And the microbes do a really good job of breaking it down, releasing more energy, 
and actually produce a large collection of chemicals that are really important in managing cancer and managing health and your immune system. You will produce nearly 11 and a half tons of poo in your lifetime. <laughs> that is a lot of poo. And half of that will be bacterial, to give you a sense. So when a poo sample comes out, a lot of people don't look at it, I do. I look at that, <laughs> and it's 50% of that is bacterial mass. That is a lot of bacteria. It's not easy to grow that much bacteria. So we're born sterile. Within the first five years, we're colonized by different bacteria. It's a battle. And then about five years, it all becomes a nice, stable system. And that's generally as we're weaned off breast milk, formula milk, onto solids. And you have that for the rest of your life. And it just changes slightly as you age, as your diet changes slightly, as your immune system changes slightly, it'll modify. But what we know is there are interventions, surgery, especially gastric bypass, for bariatric, bar it's also called bariatric surgery, for weight loss, really modifies what happens in your large intestine. We know that diet within 48 hours can modify what's in your large intestine. Drugs, like antibiotics, and a lot of other drugs, like chemotherapy drugs, will modify what's in your, gut ba in, in your intestine, and pregnancy does. And what we don't know at the moment is if you change from one trajectory to another, what, does that have in, what impact does it have in terms of your life journey? We're not at that stage yet, because as I said, we haven't even got 100 years of data on this. We've only got 20 years of data. So what are the microbes doing? What I've identified here in red are those that I think are relevant to cancer, okay? They help your immune system. They are a fundamental way that your immune system gets trained. And it also bolsters your immune system. So especially for drugs that are involved in modifying your immune system, especially in melanoma, where it tells your immune system where a cancer cell is, having a robust immune system is really beneficial to that. It also activates drugs. A lot of people don't realize that if you were a sterile human being, there are many drugs that, we, if, uh, that clinicians will give to you that wouldn't work because they're in an active state. And they need to be tuned into the active state. And a lot of the times, the microbes in your gut do that step. And so if you haven't got the right, mi right microbes in your gut to do that step, switch it from inactive or what's called a pro-drug to the active drug, you will not gain benefit from that. And this is where we're coming down to the personalized or precision medicine, is trying to make sure that if somebody hasn't got that, we don't give them the drug that's not going to work. An example of this is in rheumatoid arthritis, an anti-inflammatory drug called sulfazalazine. You give it to somebody, it needs a bacterium in the gut to break it down, to turn it into another drug called 5-ASA, and then you get the properties of the anti-inflammatory nature of that drug. If you don't have that bacterium, it just washes through you and you gain no benefit from it. So, they're beneficial to you. And this is what we're trying to do, is understand the benefits and understand how we can maximize those benefits. <clears throat> They're also a liability and a problem. So here I have shown that they break down dietary carcinogens. So they break down cancer-causing agents that we introduce into our diet when we cook it. Microbes are really good at breaking that down and protecting us against that. Unfortunately, the flip side is they also make carcinogens or cancer-causing agents. And so what we need to do is understand how we minimize those cancer-causing bacteria in the large intestine and the small intestine. They can also be um, responsible for how you respond to your drug. So not just activating the drug, but in terms of do you respond to a drug? There are drugs for heart disease. That if, again, if you have certain bacteria in your gut, you will not respond to that drug. They're also involved in driving side effects of these drugs. So we need to understand how to minimize it. And as I said, they're implicated in obesity, diabetes, and for this audience, they're really important, we think, in cancer initiation. Now, this next slide is a little bit busy. I don't want you to read all the things like APC and normal epithelium. This is a colorectal cancer, colon cancer model. So I think this, this model is very relevant to every cancer. So basically, you've got 90-odd 90, 90 trillion cells in your body, and each day, those cells have to reproduce. And when they reproduce, if they don't do it properly, or a piece of DNA gets damaged, they can start going on a trajectory to becoming a cancer cell. For the majority of the time, your immune system's really good at identifying, seeing that potential cancer cell and killing it off. But sometimes, as we know, that doesn't happen, and the cell goes along this trajectory until it becomes a cancer, and then it starts spreading. What we've realized is that in the gut, not in the skin, because the skin microbiota is much simpler, but in the gut, there is a role for those microbes actually initiating what we call that first hit, that damage to the DNA 
that causes a cell to go on a pathway to become a cancer cell. So we're interested there. In the gut, we're also interested in the development of the tumor. And what we found is a tumor is a new environment. So bacteria live on the gut wall. When a tumor arises, it's a totally different environment to what's norm in a normal healthy gut. And new bacteria then, from the oral cavity, when they pass down, you swallow them, they can get onto that tumor, they start interacting with the tumor, and they can help it develop. They start affecting the immune system, making the immune system blind to the tumor, and they promote the tumor growth. So we're interested in understanding that. But I think one of the really interesting areas for us is this final one here, and it's in the treatment of the tumor. So we know majority of cancers are acquired rather than inherited, so it gets very difficult to prevent cancers. And I think that's why we see a lot of the research money going into treating cancers, because getting people to prevent cancers is very difficult, especially for melanoma, which is driven by UV light. We all need to go outside. We all need UV light to make vitamin D. So we can't get away from that potential trigger. So what we need to understand is how we, we um, enhance the treatment of these tumors and how we understand how the microbiome is involved in it. And so the bacteria can determine if you respond to a cancer drug. And that's what we're interested in, 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 in getting involved in the microbes and how they're involved in cancer. But now we're starting to see how they maps out to melanomas, to pancreatic cancer, to lung cancer, to other cancers, especially the immunotherapy cancers. So in melanoma, we know that the response rate is not 100%. That's the ideal. That's where we want to be. We know it's between 40 and 50%, and this level of response needs to be 100%. So what is stopping us getting to 100%? Why don't people, 100% of people respond to the immunotherapies? There are different reasons, but one that we're seeing is that the gut microbiota, what lives in your large intestine, is bearing and causing an influence on how you respond to this immunotherapy. And also the side effects. I know for immunotherapy, the, one of the most common side effects are dermatitis and colitis, so gut inflammation, then hepatitis, liver inflammation. And so we're trying to understand how the gut microbiota, especially in the gut inflammation arena, is involved and driving that. Have the wrong community in bacteria, um, of bacteria in your gut leads to immune system, this is what we think, that does not work properly and does not respond to immunotherapy. So we're at a stage now, we know we can modify the gut microbiota. While it maybe it's not ethical to edit your genome, it's ethical, and nobody seems to really care that much whether we kill lots of bacteria in your gut. So we have some tools. We've got antibiotics, but they're blunt. And they're blunt and also lead to antibiotic-resistant bacteria, which the predictions for 2050 mean there are going to be 10 million deaths a year due to antibiotic-resistant bacteria. So we don't want to add to that. So we need a new novel treatment. And what we've been looking at in St. Mary's is this idea that if your human microbiome isn't in the right place, then we can actually take a stool donation from an immunotherapy responder to somebody who's been given the immunotherapy and shown response to it, take the microbiota and infuse it and transplant it into the gut of somebody who has not responded to immunotherapy. This is quite a left field idea, okay? You may have heard of it, you may not, but there are two papers out there a couple of years ago which showed that this works. So in the, in the 40 to 50 percent, or the 60 percent of patients, 50 to 60 percent of patients who didn't respond, about 30 to 40 percent of those were turned into responders by taking stool samples from a responder, putting a tube down into the small intestine, and squeezing those microbes into that gut, and then giving them the drug a second time and seeing if they responded to it. And there are now clinical trials out testing this in a proper, these were just case series where they taken individuals, they hadn't tested them against what's called a placebo or um, a, a, a sham arm, okay? But this is now actually moving out and there are companies developing capsule forms of this. So you don't have to this invasive tube into your small intestine and the risk that that, that that poses. You can have a capsule of this, 10 capsules, pop it down, but it's a microbiota, a stool sample that's been screened for a load of pathogens and, and then, then used for, for, for this treatment. And this is becoming quite a hot topic area. And the data is starting to really show that this is important. This was a colleague of mine, David Pinato from, from St. Mary's. What this graph shows here is survival. This is survival for immunotherapy in a wide range of different cancers. So there's lung cancers, there were melanoma cancers. And so this shows at a, 
Beginning, you've got 100% of the people are alive. Then over time, you can see how they survive, the proportion survive. This was actually looking at what happens if you give somebody an antibiotic before they have their immunotherapy or an antibiotic after they have their immunotherapy. And these antibiotics were what we call broad spectrum. They damaged everything in the gut. They weren't targeted at one single organism. They just wiped out everything in the gut. Those that had an antibiotic prior to the immunotherapy did not survive really at all compared to those who had no prior antibiotics. So this was telling us something about that if you do something to your gut microbiota, whether it's have a poor diet, whether it's have antibiotics, then we need to rehabilitate it in some way to give you a better chance of responding. And this has given us the information that we need to, 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 to in order to carry on a clinical trial where we can see is there value in taking somebody's gut microbiota, which we know has been effective antibiotics, and then making it much more diverse with a stool transplant and then seeing if they respond and they help their immune system to respond. So we're now doing this in bone marrow transplant patients. And we've seen that bone marrow transplant patients are at very high risk of getting um, antibiotic resistant bloodstream infections because their blood's not working properly, they can't fight off bacteria, they get lots of bloodstream infections. And they go through numerous rounds of chemotherapy, numerous rounds of antibiotics to the point that when they come for their bone marrow transplant, their gut microbiota is so depleted and so affected that when they do have it, they don't have very good outcomes. So in a small study, we actually did these studies, um, we did these prehabilitation studies. So we actually went in before they had their bone marrow transplant with a stool um, transplant. And what we saw was that number of bloodstream infection went down, number of days in intensive care went down. In fact, all the patients who had a stool transplant, none of them went to intensive care with problems after this stool compared to those who didn't. And their over overall survival goes up by 40%. And this is all by modifying and increasing the diversity in their large intestine and small intestine. So we improved the gut microbiota doing a fecal microbiota transplant before the, bone tran before the bone marrow transplant, not after it. Not after the event. We try to prehabilitate their gut, get it into a good place, and give them the best possible chance of responding to the bone marrow transplant and surviving it. But what about my diet? Everybody wants to know about their diet. Unfortunately, the best thing I can tell you is eat more fiber. That, that is good advice, okay? Unfortunately, it's very difficult to follow diets. And really, we should have started this in our teens. I'm too late for it. Unfortunately, a lot of us are too late. This is something you should have been able to go back and tell your 15-year-old self, eat 30 to 40 grams of fiber a day to maximize the chances of your gut microbiome to be really diverse and to help it bolster you as an individual and support you as an individual. It's the same advice you must be, should tell yourself to go back and say, if you want a great heart, you're going to run two to three miles every day from 15 up to, up to 80. You're going to not drink too much. You're not going to do X, Y, and Z. OK, it's not going to be much fun, OK? <laughs> but you're going to live until you're 100 with the 100 years of health. No, I mean, the point is that diet, whilst it's, we know there is an important aspect to it, it isn't precise enough at the moment. However, a fecal micro microbiota transplant can make a difference within 48 hours. And as I like to say, that's the power of poo, as, as Huey Lewis would say. And on that point, I'll leave it there. Thank you.